Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show, I'm your host Paul, and in this video we're breaking down Doom Part 2. The movie is packed with hidden details, deeper themes to analyse, and lots of changes from the book that I can't wait to talk about. Since the release of the movie, I've read through the book, the recently released graphic novels, Gone Through Messiah, and also Children of Dune. Well, well, the audiobook for that last one, because it, it's a bit rough. I even bought the paperback collection ju just for the covers. Look at that artwork. And it's safe to say I've gone to Arrakis and got the t-shirt. I'm obsessed with the universe and all the things within it, and hopefully this will be the most in-depth breakdown on Dune Part 2. Until Quinn's ideas releases his though and, and dumps all over it. However, until then, I want to go through the movie scene by scene and talk about everything that you need to know about it. Stop while you're Dune, and if you enjoy the video, please hit a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe for videos like this every day, and without the way, huge thank you for clicking this. Now let's get into Dune. Now just like the first film, we begin with a message before we even get to the studio logos. The initial one discussed dreams being messages from the deep, which we've gone over the themes of in our first breakdown. This included theories that it was genetic memory, and even potentially later the second in the future looking back. Genetic memory plays into the movie highly, with it being something Paul and Jessica tap into with the water of life. This allows them to look back through their entire lineage and gain all the memories of their ancestors. In the case of Elia, it ushers in something darker, as those who go through the ceremony whilst they're in the womb are known as the preborn. This means that they have an entire personality before they're even born, and this is due to the fact they're able to tap into all the memories of their ancestors. However, this also leaves them open to being possessed by these ancestors, which is something that's a big part of Children of Dune. Now, Elia doesn't get born in this movie, whereas in the book, she's a big part of the latter half. The Fremen viewed her as being extremely creepy, and the Benny Gesserit referred to her as an abomination in the throne room. At the end though, this is said to Paul instead, with him also killing the Baron instead of Aaliyah. Abomination. How about you suck Atreides nuts? Got he! <laughs> now, the original work had Aaliyah doing it, but they put more focus on him and his ascension to the throne. This all comes down to the power that he wields, as the opening says... <laughs> Now, this is more straightforward than the first film, with it showcasing that the power balance here will forever swing in favour of the one that controls it. Spice is the most precious substance in the universe because it's what the Spacing Guild use for navigation. It also allows for prescience, humans to live longer, and several other things. The entire universe is addicted to spice, and thus Paul controlling Arrakis means he controls everything. The first film also had a strong focus on power, with that being the reason the Duke was excited to go to Arrakis. Here on Caladan, we've ruled by air power and sea power. On Arrakis, we need to cultivate desert power. This was played off at the end by Paul, who realised they could finally achieve it. Desert power. However, the idea of power also leans in the direction of this movie, with it having more focus on action. Dreams in the first, that gave us a more contemplative movie, whereas for this, it's just all out war. Now at this point, we hear Princess Erland's narration. This is heavily in line with the book, as every single chapter starts with a segment from her. This is also something that the David Lynch film used, with the movie starting up with her narration. However, it also has a deeper meaning, as it shows thematically the future that Paul will have. The first movie began with Chani's narration, whereas this one's dealing with his future wife. It's sort of Erland shoving her out of the way thematically, so that she can replace Chani in more ways than one. Even the way the final fight is set up, it's supposed to show the future and the past. Chani and the Fremen stand on one side of the room, whereas Irulan and House Carino, they stand on the other. Paul eventually moves over to those, showcasing how he's left those on the other side behind him. It's another massive change up from the books, as Chani is clearly scorned by what's gone down in the finale. I'll talk about that more in depth later on, but Irulan discusses how Leto was like a son to the Emperor. This is also a direct quote from the book, and it also details his reaction in the work. It says, When my father, the Padishah Emperor, heard of Duke Leto's death and the manner of it, he went into such a rage as we'd never before seen. He blamed my mother and the compact forced on him to place the Bene Gesserit on the throne. He blamed the guild and the evil old Baron. He blamed everyone in sight, not excepting even me, for he said I was a witch like all the others. And when I sought to comfort him, saying it was done according to an older law of self-preservation, to which even the most ancient rulers gave allegiance, he sneered at me and asked if I thought him a weakling. I saw that he had been aroused to this passion not by concern over the 
their duke, but by what the death implied for all royalty. As I look back on it, I think there may have been some prescience in my father too, for it is certain that his line of Muad'Dib shared common ancestry. This is all that here, as the Emperor says nothing with him not being the same since. His inaction is telling, and it shows his hand in it because if he cared, he would have brought wrath to the barons. However, as Erland says, they've done his dirty work before. Now, the reason that he did it is because the Atreides were getting too popular, and thus they had the potential of ousting him. Christopher Walken's version is slightly different from the work, as in that the Emperor seemed like a younger man. Described as being middle aged looking, his life had been prolonged by spice, whereas here yeah, they just went all out. And and had him as an older dude. This coincidentally is a weird callback to Walken's past as he danced to the phrase walk without rhythm and you won't attract the worm in Fatboy Slim's weapon of choice. Now the fall of House Atreides is shown symbolically through the burning of bodies and artifacts. This is in the aftermath of the Battle of Arrakeen which happened at the midpoint of the last movie. The imagery is later echoed at the end of this film when we see the Fremen burning the Harkonnen and the Carino forces. The Duke's painting is there which is in a similar vein to his own father's one that appeared at the beginning of part one. We see as the Atreides sigil melts and dissolves symbolically cementing the house as being destroyed. From here we then cut to Irulan and the Emperor playing what seems to be chess. In the books though the game's called Shops but it, it basically just operates in the same way. Now the game has some symbolism attached to it as it's about taking down kings. The Queen is the most powerful player potentially symbolizing how Irulan will gain power throughout the movie. Paul's marriage to her was even suggested in the first film when he said this. And the Emperor has no sons and his daughters are yet to marry. You'd make a play for the throne. Now from here we cut across to the Baron anointing Raban as the Duke. There's clear allusions here to Hitler's propaganda film Triumph of the Will with soldiers and banners lining the area. The Baron glides about using his suspension tech which symbolically shows that he's above all the rest. We also see that he's got balls attached onto tubes with these getting sliced throughout the end. Clearly he has difficulty breathing and it's explained more in depth in the books. Chapter 26 says that the Baron's still suffering from a gas attack hence the weakened breathing that he takes on at the end. On the banners we we can also catch the Harkonnen sigil which is meant to resemble a griffin whereas the Atreides one's a hawk. This shows how interlinked the two families are with their lineage being exposed throughout the film. And we also learn of the Baron and Emperor's close connection with the former using this to blackmail the latter. This is all a power play to put fade on the throne and the anointment of Raban even has a double side to it. The book explains that Raban was a vicious man which the Baron used to make the people of Arrakis hate him. Thus when he ushered in fade he'd become more popular because he had a gentle a touch. Whether that's a reality or not is another thing entirely, but it's all about the image it portrays. Everything is done in order to get the spice, with the hierarchical structures being explained by Lietkines' father in chapter 31. The passage says, Arrakis is a one crop planet, his father said. One crop. It supports a ruling class that lives as ruling classes have lived in all times while beneath mass semi-slaves exist on the leavings. It's the masses and the leavings that occupy our attention. These are far more valuable than has ever been suspected. Now from here we cut to Alia in the womb with Paul talking directly to her. When I first saw this I thought it might be a worm or something but obviously it's a newly created fetus. In the books the story in the desert happens over several years whereas the movie shortens that down to just a handful of months. This takes place in the air 10 191, which was shown to us at the start of the first film. This is 10191 AG, meaning after the Spacing Guild was formed, with it roughly being around 20,000 years AD if we're going off our time. Jessica's pregnancy is used to denote the time in the movie, with us watching the fetus grow throughout the film. Children were a strong focus in the novel, with it being a coming of age story for Paul. However, something else that's absent is that he has his own child who unfortunately is killed in one of the Harkonnen assaults. This baby was called Leto after Paul's father father and I wonder how they're going to handle Leto the second. Guessing that they'll just refer to him as Leto and Fu. He gets up to some crazy stuff. Now there's lots of allusions to 2001 with it almost echoing the star child's meaning in that. That was the next step in human evolution and all the Atreides becomes something else in this movie. The de-aging on Anya Taylor Joy, it's crazy and yeah, what, what a unique way to introduce the character. Now, the entire movie is built around characters and dialogue with her and I love the way she starts off as this almost alien thing. Cutting to the skyline, we see the sun being eclipsed by the two moons of Arrakis with the larger of these being the hand 
of God. The hand of God leading the way, that's metaphorically seen in the speech later on when Paul talks about how his hand leads the way. The smaller of these moons is nicknamed Muad'Di, which is a nickname that Paul later takes on. In the book, he predicted this during the tenth scene, which happened in chapter 22. He said he would be known as Muad'Dib, whereas in the film, he came across the mouse upon exiting the tent. We then pan across to see Jamis's body, which they're carrying through the desert for his water. The book expanded upon what happened when he reached the sea edge, and we learned that Paul had some extra responsibilities. He had to look after Jamis's family and either take his wife as his or as a maid for a year. Known as Hara, she was a keen helping raise Aaliyah, and eventually she ended up marrying Stilgar. Now, if you're interested in expanding a Dune collection, then definitely check out our partners at Arrow Video. They remastered and put together the 4K release of the David Lynch film and they've got a ton of different movies on the site. This includes things like Robocop, the massive Child's Play collection, The Ring and so many amazing movies. If you click my link in the description and use the code heavy spoilers then you're also going to get an extra 10% off. Whenever you go to the site if you want to buy anything just use the code heavy spoilers and you're going to get that 10% off. I saved you some money. Shabow! Now the book also talks about how the Fremen move across the desert with Jessica discussing it in chapter 31. She talked about how they move like a military company with them seeming like ghosts amongst the sands. It's also on this page that she discusses the meaning of the word Siech with the group heading to Siech Tabur. Siech means a meeting place in time of danger with it being a sanctuary for the Fremen. The term Kwisatz Haderach is based off the Hebrew phrase Ker Fizat Haderach which according to IMDb Trivia means a miraculous journey between two distant places in a brief time. Lisa and Al Gaibs used heavily throughout the film with it also being something Stelgar constantly says. Lisa Al Gaib! Lisa Al Gaib is based off Arabic and it means tongue of the unseen. In June, it's the voice of another world which is outlined in their legends as the person that will save them. Chapter 24 says the Fremen believe that whoever dies in service of the Lisa Al Gaib shall live forever, hence why so many are willing to be led into paradise. There's also the phrase Mahdi which is Islamic in nature. Said to appear at the end of time, the Mahdi will wipe the world of evil. Now originally this scene was gonna end the first film, but they decided during prep they'd end on that worm tease and then start the sequel here. From this point the Harkonnen forces then descend into the desert and we get several shots of them silhouetted against the orange. This is very reminiscent of the cover of the paperback and it just instantly captures you just because of how bright it is. Although it seems like they're the more formidable force, they're actually vastly outmatched. Their armor is slow, clunky and stands out against the sand and sky making them easy targets to pick apart. These soldiers just aren't used to the harsh environments which is why the Fremen are the most fearsome foes in the universe. The book actually has a big section talking about this and how the Emperor's forces are so strong. Detailing how they're trained on what's basically a prison planet, it goes into the depths of Seleucus Secundus. They talk about how his army are trained their entire lives on what's basically hell and that's still not as harsh as the lands of Arrakis. This is why the Fremen are so powerful because their entire existence is built around survival. Now in the book, when the Sadokar attacked Arakeen, they disguised themselves as the Harkonnen so the Emperor's lines wouldn't be noticed. The first film didn't really bother doing that and I did wonder if these were Sadokar forces. They're not though, as we later see them unmasked with their water being described as filthy. Now amongst this danger, we also have beauty which is shown so well when they float up the rocks. This was the scene that blew me away and I knew right then that we were in for some cinema. This is also the suspense attack that the Baron used with it being equipped in his army. They then snipe with the command being no shields which is also explained in the book. The passage talks about how shocked the Atreides were to learn they didn't use shields with them having this conversation. According to Idaho's reports how it said shields are dangerous in the desert. A body sized shield will call every worm for hundreds of meters around it. It appears to drive them into a killing frenzy. We have the Fremen word on this and no reason to doubt it. Idaho saw no evidence of shield equipment at the siege. So you can see why they'd avoid it as it's basically blood in the water when you're swimming amongst sharks. We then watch as the bodies fall from the cliff which is again another amazing piece of cinema. Going toe to toe with some of the soldiers, Paul easily bests ones because he's trained by the best of the best of the best, sir. This is why he made mincemeat of Jamis because for his entire life he's been trained by the best swordsmen and fighters. However he doesn't watch his back which is something they constantly try to hammer home in the book. Gurney said it during the first film which is also something we'll talk about later on. Early on in the book Howard constantly says he should never sit with his back to the door which he then jokes about. This is so assassins can't sneak up on him which Jessica is now having to stop. However this ties into the deeper themes of the movie and it sums up her arc. She's going to kill and do whatever she needs to protect her son even if it means turning him into the messiah. He's not the messiah, 
is a very naughty boy! This in itself pulls from the book without outlining in chapter 3 that she should shield him no matter what. The style Paul fights with here was developed for the movie with a bringing forth the weirding way from the books. This in the series requires a combatant to alter their perception of time and thus they can move at incredibly fast speeds. In the David Lynch film it was about the manipulation of sound which had Paul using sonic weapons. Here though they just don't really acknowledge it but have combat being something that Paul's adept at. We then see the Fremen draining water from their victims with Jamis' still suit later being filled with it too. This is almost like a mummification with his body being completely wrapped. Chapter 16 has a big banquet scene in which Paul talks about the still suit to the daughter of a manufacturer. It explains how it collects sweat, tears, urine and even shit. So yep, yeah, all these people, they're having a crap right now. That's canon. This then processes it into moisture so that the user can use it to keep themselves hydrated. In the chapter they talk about how a man actually drowned in his sue because his body was submerged in water for so long. This chapter also explains why shields can be dangerous in the desert as it goes over what happens if a laser gun hits one. This can cause an atomic reaction due to the shields and lasers causing what basically happens when you cross the streams with a proton pack. In the book when Duncan meets Paul and Jessica in the desert we see a gigantic explosion behind him. This is because he used it as a trap and thus the Harkon and forces are reluctant to use their shields. Now moisture is obviously the most important thing to the Fremen as it's all they have amongst the desert. Surrounded by spice, the most important substance in the galaxy holds little meaning as they have it in about everything. This is a flip from Paul's home Kaladin which was absent of spice but surrounded by water. The Fremen view all moisture is important so when Jessica starts vomiting you can see why, why Stelgar's a bit like Phew. I was a bit like ooh. Now he even wipes her tears and drinks it later on because water is such a valuable substance on Dune. Because of this the Fremen have held themselves back from crying and even when a loved one dies they don't shed a tear. When Paul killed Jamis the group gasped and talked about how he gave water to the dead with this phrase meaning to basically cry over those that have gone. This is a phrase that pops up in the temple but it's seen as a strength with these people having deeper emotions. Just watching that dude get the fluid sucked out of him by Zendaya makes me realise what it must be like being Tom Holland. <laughs> but can't say that dear me, dear me either way it shows they drain them while they're still alive and they cover their crimes by using the worms to get rid of the bodies not really crimes you, you know what i'm saying now from here they make it to the ch and we see how the fremen are distrustful of paul and you could say that they're frenemies however they represent the figures jessica must later convert and we see inside the ch how some already believe Paul understands the aspects of their language as he's been trained by birth by masterful linguists. The source material tells us that tongues are one of the first things the Bene Gesserit learn as this is something that helps them do the voice. According to the wiki, the Fremen language is called Chaco Bazaar, which derives from Arabic. Apologies for butchering that pronunciation. And the reason that Paul's able to pick things up fast is detailed to us in the beginning of chapter 9. That talks about how rather than learning, Paul is shown how to learn how to learn. Knowing how to pick things up quickly means he can do it with a lot of skills which them Fremen see as him taking it up naturally. Thus he's able to appear like the prophet because it seems like the ways are natural to him. Now we discover there's fundamentalists in the south with religion being stronger down there. Shout out to the now playing podcast for pointing out this may be based off America and how religion tends to be stronger in the south too. In to amongst these scenes we learn the Harkonnens won't venture into the south with not even satellites scanning the area. The book explains that it's too expensive to pay the space and guild to monitor it but it turned out there was a deeper side to it. Why? Well the Fremen they were secretly giving the guild spice in exchange for not spying on what they got up to. Raban is absolutely furious and he ends up smashing that poor bloke's head just like it's the like button. <laughs> so sad. Lots of Harkonnen servants getting killed in this movie which hey not really m much job security. Still though, lots of room for promotion and could be worse, could be working at Screen Crush. <laughs> Shut the f up, Ryan Airy. I'm kidding, Ryan, I love you, you, you chump. Now at the CH, we see more of their culture and throughout the movie, you see that the women are warriors as well. In the book, there's a quote that says, the women are as fierce as the men and they're all valued as equals. No other society in the universe does this with it being part of the patriarch. All the women for the Harkonnens are seen as servants and the Benny have to move in the shadows. Even Jessica was a concubine, or as the Fremen have them on the front line. Now we see as Stilgar then meets with the elders with his faith defying logic. The others laugh at him but he believes it because the Jesuit have told their prophecy for millennia. 
Eventually, someone will come along that would fit this or at least come across in a way that people can see the signs and change the prophecy to fit exactly what's happening. It's basically confirmation bias and as Paul eats, he sees a vision of his father's portrait rising up. As we saw in the opening, this has been destroyed and thus it's a symbolic metaphor of the Fremen worshipping the house. In the book, we learn this portrait was painted by an artist named Alba, with him also providing the one of Leto's dad. Keep saying Leo and Leo, apo apologies for that, uh, but this was of course burned. However, he still envisions it, showcasing how his visions aren't completely accurate. Now, chapter 32 goes into exactly what happened with the spice in the food, and it says, Paul stood beside Chani in the shadows of the inner cave. He could still taste the morsel she had fed him, bird flesh and grain bound with spice honey and encased in a leaf. In tasting it, he had realised he never before had eaten such a concentration of spice essence, and there had been a moment of fear. He knew what this essence could do to him, the spice change that pushed his mind into prescient awareness. This shows how it's going to alter him and explains the visions that he gets here. Jessica then says, Your father didn't believe in revenge. Yeah, I do. Now this is the first clue that he has Harkonnen in him and it cements what the Emperor says at the end. Your father was a weak man. Thus he felt like he may be the wrong person to rule if he ever became Emperor. In the book, we discover that the Emperor had to answer to the Landstrad High Council, which has the power to oust him if it seems like his actions put them at risk. There are 157 great houses that compose them, with them ruling over 10,000 planets. This is why Paul disrupts so much, because Spice is a part of the ecosystem of them all. Now, Chapter 34 also tells us Jessica's thoughts at this moment. It talked about how the Fremen women wouldn't make a good wife for a duke. However, they would make a good concubine, which plays into how the book leaves things off. Jessica wistfully thinks, and yet I was more than a concubine, which has a deeper meaning that we'll talk about at the end. Now, it's in this chapter that Chani also brings up why Jamis was carried back. It says the flesh belongs to the person, but the water belongs to the tribe. Paul was offered Jamis' water, but he turned it down, which is something Chani couldn't understand. To her, water is water, and so Jessica makes him accept it so the pair can then fit in. The winner of the fight would normally always take the water, and this would make up for the moisture that they lost during the battle. Everyone is super strict with water, and in chapter 36, not even his wife Hara cries over Jamis as she refuses to give water to the dead. Now for the movie, Jamis' water is deposited into a great sacred shrine containing 38 million decaliters. This will one day be used to terraform the planet and turn Dune back to the paradise it once was. We saw hints of this back in part 1, with there being a room ecologist who are growing plants in. Stilgo also tells Jessica that Lisa and Al-Gaib will be the son of a reverend mother, which is expanded in chapter 33. In chapter 31, one of the first things he asks Jessica is if she is one, so it shows how important this is as a characteristic to him. However, Stilgo is sort of forcing the legend to come true, as he's making Jessica one so that Paul fits the prophecy. Mothers make up a lot of religious tales, with messianic figures being greatly led by them. Christianity, of course, has Mary, with Herbert taking inspiration from that. Jessica's then taken to consume the water of life, which we learn more in depth in the book. Chapter 37 gives us a ceremony, with the main difference there being that Jessica says that there's at least 10,000 people there, and more to come to it. As nervous as she is though, Jessica says she has no choice, and must move quickly to secure their place amongst the people. She describes the mother as a crone, looking like a collection of sticks striped in a black robe. Chapter 37 describes the elder as old and frail, yet she has a darker side to her which we see in the voice in the movie. Now in the book we can of course get descriptions of what the water of life tastes like, with Jessica saying that there's a cinnamon aftertaste, but it's a lot cooler than the spices. Fed to her by Chani, she clearly sees the features in her face of the Ekkinds, showing that he was her father. In the first movie, they gender swap the character, but this explains where her lineage comes from. Now, in going through the transformation, the water of life expanded her perception and slowed down time, and though she was able to counter the poison. Jessica survives this because Benny Jessera are able to manipulate their bodies on a cellular level, and thus they can counteract poisons and break them down. This is also how they're able to choose the sex of their child, and the group are capable of emitting strong pheromones. This is how Margot seduces Faye later on, and why even Helen Maheim was talking about giving it a go. Go on! Now the Reverend Mother and Jessica, they link up mentally, and she sees her as a younger woman who says this is how she really is, and that time is all perception. Now this is also how the mother knows that Jessica's pregnant. Jessica sees the inner eye, and the mother says be thankful it's a female, as a male would have died. You'll have to be strong, the old Reverend Mother's image presence said. Be thankful it's a daughter you carry. This would have killed a male fetus. 
How carefully, gently, touch your daughter presence. Be your daughter presence. Absorb the fear. Soothe. Use your courage and your strength. Gently now. Gently. The other whirling moat swept near and Jessica compelled herself to touch it. Terror threatened to overwhelm her. She fought it, the only way she knew. I shall not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Now we see the inner eye embodied in Aaliyah's opening up, highlighting how the fetus now has full awareness. The book then says the old woman dies and as she passes, she pours her memories into Jessica. Her final words are, I've been a long time waiting for you and here is my life. Now it's in this moment that Jessica learns she's the daughter of the Baron, which we learn more about in the books. In the novel, it was revealed that Reverend Mother Guy's Helen Maheim was all worded by the Baron, which is how the baby was conceived. Helen then cursed the Baron and placed a disease on him that ended up making him morbidly obese. I know that was brought into the canon later on, and someone always kicks off when I mention it, but it, it is, it's worth at least acknowledging it, guys. Come on. Anyway, the book handled the reveal slightly differently, with Paul bringing it up when they were in the tent. This happened during chapter 22, and the passage reads like this. When you next find a mirror, study your face. Study mine now. The traces are there if you don't blind yourself. Look at my hands, the set of my bones. And if none of this convinces you, then take my word for it. I've walked the future. I've looked at a record. I've seen a place. I have all the data. We are Harkonnens. A renegade branch of the family, she said. That's it, isn't it? Some Harkonnen cousin who... You're the Baron's own daughter, he said, and watched the way she pressed her hands to her mouth. The Baron sampled many pleasures in his youth, and once permitted himself to be seduced, but it was for the genetic purposes of the Bene Gesserit by one of you. Now this process is described as highly dangerous, as it often leads to possession, with it also creating an abomination if someone's pregnant. We see the water rushing over Aaliyah, and at this moment she's turned. Now outside we see Paul kind of just standing by himself, looking to make friends. I think we've all been somewhere like this where with a new person who's just awkwardly standing about trying to conquer Arrakis and there's something really subtle that he does. He looks over to the elders who clearly want him to come hang out with them but instead goes to people his age who clearly don't believe. This is possibly to convert them or you know try and turn the people who might be against him and it's a very subtle thing that the character does. At this point we're also properly introduced to Shashakli after she made fun of him for not being able to handle the spicy food. Guy would go lemon and herb at Nando's, and we see outside that she constantly shuts him down. In chapter 40, we're properly introduced to the character, with it actually being a man who's a close ally of Stilgar. Just before the worm ride, he gives Paul his hooks and says they've never failed. Now here she says the water of life is just worm piss, and we later learn how it is they extract it. Chapter 44 ends by explaining the drowning of a worm, which we see later in the movie. The book says... And the drowning of a maker was the greatest from in secret because it produced the substance of their union, the water of life, the poison that could only be changed by a reverend mother. Now I love how Stilgar is still saying, Paul's the Lisa al Gaib, and if he says he's not, that just means that he's the Lisa al Gaib. Now it's at this point we also really get to see the blue eyes perfectly, with this being done through the use of CGI. Originally, they just wanted to use blue contact lenses, but realised the sound would cause issues and get stuck behind them. She Shackley also says that Maddie must be Fremen, and this is something brought up during chapter 40. That has Paul, who's pretty much viewed as the leader, but he's not seen as a Fremen due to not riding the worm yet. As Jessica recovers, she then tells him he must drink the water of life. In the book, right after she went through it and he was with Chani, it was revealed her name was Desert Spring. At this point, he also saw Billy instead ahead of them, which I think you can read into seeing Paul's reaction in this moment. Paul is then sent into the desert, mimicking how Jesus did it in the Bible. I love how Stilgar says you have to worry about the little centipedes, and then he does the gesture your girlfriend does when she's describing her ex. He also brings up the djinn, which are of course based off the word genie. The word doesn't appear anywhere in the book, and I did wonder why this scene was included. I think it's here to just show the Fremen are superstitious, and thus they can be manipulated. However, Stilgar says, don't listen to the voices, and perhaps the jinn are the ones that speak to him throughout the visions. Making his way across the desert, we've seen him learning to walk like this in part one when he was studying the Fremen video books. Initially, he sees what appears to be a vision of Jamis, and in both films, Paul sees him as a mentor. This, of course, never came to be, but it shows how his visions aren't always right. Instead, Chani takes up the spot with a pair falling in love. In the book, right after the Water of Life ritual with Jessica, Paul and Chani bond. That's when the pair sort of intertwine mentally, and he sees all the paths and his attachment to the Fremen. 
Chapter 34 has Paul saying he was a friend of Jamis and he joins in with the rest of the Fremen who are saying the same thing. There was part of the ritual honouring him but here I feel it extends beyond that to show how in some realities he really was a mentor to him. Either way, he and Chani hit it off whilst he learns of moisture trappers while Jessica starts out her plan. It's so chilling seeing her muttering away to her baby and though we don't hear Elia's voice at this point, it does pop up after Paul has a vision of her. Jessica targets children because they're easier to manipulate and she will build a legend of Paul to help ensure his safety. Being a reverend mother of course means she's a Benny Chesra and they've of course always used this MO to control the people of Arrakis. Now at this point we see a Muad'Dib going up to a snorkel that's sticking out the ground so the user can breathe. We actually got a glimpse of these during the first film in that opening montage that showcased the Fremen. It leads into an absolutely incredible scene in which we follow Paul going out on a raid. This is such a nail biting skirmish that looked incredible in IMAX and you really got the massive scale of these battles. The Fremen are sleeker and faster than their opponents so they're able to run, duck and roll while they're restricted to the mobility of their armour. Now the main thing I've seen people complain about is why didn't they just take down the Ornithopter with a laser but as we discussed before it could have caused an atomic, atomic explosion I should say. Thus Paul and Chani need to take it down first and then the laser guns can be fired to destroy the spice harvester. Just that moment where Chani fires the rocket and then the gunner looks and sees the shot is breaking the shield is so good and yeah this is a standout piece of the movie. Now this is also an important thing for Paul to do as it shows that he's willing to get his hands dirty. Rather than just simply saying he's the prophet, he fights on the ground to win the skeptics round. It's the younger members of the tribe who think that he's phony but him doing this starts to make them loyal to him. They still don't really believe it but it buys faith and friendship meaning that they'll still defend him. Now in the turn we get a scene that sort of riffs off chapter 33. This happened immediately after beating Jamis though whereas here yeah, it's a couple of months later. Still God gives the name Usul and then Paul says he wants to also be known as the Muad'Dib. Now in the book this proves that he's able to predict the future because it's something he said to Jessica back in the tent. The movie changed things and did it more in a symbolic sense with him coming across the creature. However Paul is something different from the visions and he says that he doesn't want to give up his father's name. The work says, and Paul thought that was innovation of mine. I did a different thing but he felt the abyss remained all around him. A Muad'Dib's fitting because it makes its own water either through sweat or moisture which it collects through its ears. Paul could be seen as a figure who will eventually collect all the water on the planet and then usher in a paradise that transforms Arrakis. Beyond that Paul is mouse like and small which is why so many underestimated him. Like the Muad'Dib though, he's a survivor, he's gonna make it and thus it's a perfect name for the character. And that takes us roughly into around book 3 which is titled The Prophet. It's basically the final section of the book which kind of shows how much stuff was rejigged. It's basically about Paul embracing the Fremen and becoming their prophet which we see demonstrated in him taking off the ring. Father I found my way. This calls back to the first film in which his dad highlighted the choice that wearing it brought. I told my father I didn't want this either. I wanted to be a pilot. Your grandfather said, a great man doesn't seek to lead. He's called to it. Paul saying he's found his way highlights that he's at peace and feels at home amongst the rest of the Fremen. Now in the David Lynch film, the ring was a MacGuffin that the Harkonnen and Emperor tried to get as this meant that they control the house. Here though I feel it represents the two paths that he can now walk. The first of these sees him as an equal in which he doesn't wear it and lives amongst the Fremen. The other path puts him above the Fremen as a duke who has the power over them. Later on when they're discussing the atomics we see as Paul has the ring and stares at it. This denotes the two paths he could take with the atomics leading towards a certain one. Come the temple scene he then puts it back on and announces that well I'll let him do it. I am Paul Mwadib Atreides. Duke of Arrakis. Him announcing he's a duke shows he sees himself as above them and it's why his relationship then fractures with Chani. Here he says he'd like to be her equal but in putting the ring back on he's seeing himself as rising above her. Paul and Chani then sit down on the dunes and here he explains Caladan. This was actually shown to Paul during a dream in chapter 3 which he told to Helen Maheim. It later comes to pass during chapter 40 which is where he tells Chani about the waters of his world. Chani then says a line that plays off the opening of the first film in which the same shot was used. Right there Spice. Arrakis is so beautiful when the sun is low. My planet Arrakis is so beautiful when the sun is low. You can see spice in the air. 
Now, chapter 28 explains how Caladan was a paradise, but in the end, this just made them soft. Having it easy meant they weren't tested, and thus the Atreides' house was easily taken down. Now, you really get the sense in the scene that the dunes are like an ocean, with Steven Spielberg even commenting on this. According to IMDb Trivia, he said, This is a desert-loving story, but for such a desert-loving film, there is such a yearning for water in this movie. For all the sand you have in this film, it's really about water. The sacred waters that are yearning for green meadows and the blue water of life. You film the desert to resemble an ocean, a sea. The sandworms were like sea serpents, and that scene surfing the sandworms is one of the greatest things I've ever seen, ever. But you made the desert look like a liquid. Even the way the worms are ridden, it's sort of like surfing, and this moment really plays into that here. We then get a montage of the successful raids, with a shot of Chani wearing her hood that's reminiscent of the one in the opening montage of the first film. There's clear callbacks to that throughout, with lots of the shots showing Paul's visions coming true. Back at Arakeen, we see the Baron killing his servants, and looking like Modok when he's hovering above the bath. This builds off the back of the first film, in which the Baron rising from it was a clear nod to Apocalypse Now. Now you might also notice that the blood we see in this scene is black and that's because right it allowed them to skirt around getting a higher age rating on the movie due to it not being red had it been red you know the rating would have been up so villeneuve he just kept it black and it allowed them to lower that age rating. More money. Now Paul has a dream of a woman leading him to the death of billions. I've always interpreted this as him following Jessica. However, it is possible that this could actually be Elia. She does turn around later to reveal it's Jessica, but yeah, it definitely feels like it could go either way. Chapter 34 is when Paul has visions of the Jihad leading to death, but unfortunately he realizes there's no way to stop it. If he dies, then it will just carry on through his mother and sister. Hence why I think that they appear in these visions. Now there's actually a segment from Children of Dune that seems to play off this well during chapter 62. I'm paraphrasing it here but it says the water we've spread on the sand is blood. It then goes to say that he stood upon the sand and saw a beast arising from the ground. On the head of the beast was God and that last bit especially it reminded me of Paul approaching the temple and the sandworm coming out of the dunes behind him. Either way the pair kiss and chapter 34 has an accidental courtship ritual between the pair. Paul basically drops his water and then Chani picks it up. It ends nothing but in Fremen culture, it's meant to be a sort of proposal thing because they're sharing water and some of the Fremen laugh at it. Now at this point, we get another standout scene in the movie with Paul finally riding the worm. It plays heavily off what happened in the book with Stilgar saying how he doesn't have to impress anyone with his courage. He also brings up how he prepared the thumper himself. I tune it myself. Shishakli also gives him his own hooks and says they've never failed. And the main reason that Paul wants to do this in the books is that he'll be qualified for the 20 thumper journey into the south, whereas yet yeah, he's not really willing to go. We end with Paul seeing the worm approaching and the Fremen remarking they've never witnessed one that big before. Seeming half a league long, that then takes us to chapter 42 after a brief intermission with Alia acting weird and scaring some of the adults. It says Paul must not move and he has to crouch down and become one with the desert. He says he has to do this to tackle the old man of the desert with the movie saying it's a grandfather worm. In the books we learn the older worms are the larger they grow and their body changes too. It says that the ridges and flaps get bigger too so you can instantly identify the older ones. Now the Fremen initially see the worm sign and react like it's a storm and it's only upon seeing the dune break they finally realize it's something bigger. This scene took 44 days to film and it's something Danny apparently storyboarded when he was a teenager trying to plan out the movie. Obviously he had no idea he'd be directing it but it gives the idea of how long this has been going through his mind for. They constructed practical parts of the creature too so we could zoom in and get close-ups on the flaps and so on and so forth. It's an incredible moment with Denis saying Paul standing up is his favourite shot in the film. Finally he's conquered the maker and has become one with the Fremen. They bow calling him the <laughs> Lisan al Gayib, and Chani, Chani starts to question if she's in a cult. Still though, Paul's loyal to her, and this loyalty is shown mirrored in his mother, who we catch in the next scene. I love the cut from the worm to the temple, with the mockings of it showing how he's living out the prophecy. Jessica is basically one of those pushy parents that keeps pushing their child, um, and even though she looks a bit creepy talking to her womb, people still believe her. She even has visions of Paul walking through the desert, with these shots later appearing at the temple. Paul and Chani then get it on, and Paul swears to only be with her, which highlights the lies he's gonna have to spread. He must embrace the idea he's the chosen one, even if he might not fully believe it himself. I'm not Messiah. 
Now he then bids his mother farewell as she travels south. He's annoyed that the Benny have manipulated the population and made it so they believe he's the Messiah. Chapter 40 talks about Jessica and Elia going south, but they do handle it a bit different in the movie. In the book, we basically have Paul going through a vision of them going, but he doesn't know if it's the future or the past. Due to living in pressing so long, he has memories of seeing things that are going to happen. However, because he remembers them, he doesn't know if they've already happened or not. This bit also mentions how many people have challenged him as they want to see if he is really the Maddie. Jenny ends up fighting some of them and thus they realise that if they're killed by his woman, then it's a bit embarrassing. This stops them doing it and it cements Paul's legend, whereas here Jessica builds it on her own. It's through these moments that we really see her spreading things about the worm he rode and can catch the tattoos on her face. This version of her was seen in a vision during part one and we can catch the facial markings on both. Huge shout outs to Ghost and the Eggshell on Reddit for breaking down what all these symbols translate to and they actually have their own cool little meaning. They are I must not fear, fear is the mind killer and the verse that accompanies it. Jessica then heads south and no idea how, how they got on that worm mate so if you can explain then the comment section is yours. Do as you please. Heading down the sands, we then see her do a nice little jig, which is intercut with Paul's visions of her walking to death and destruction. We end with an attack on the spice depot, which leads to abandoning his forces and attacking the Fremen. Muad'Dib perfectly cements his legend, almost moving like a ghost amongst the mist. It's such a brilliant action scene that reminded me a lot of the one from The Dark Knight Returns, and we see how fear rattles those on the ship. The sun blinds them as they fly over, and it shows how well equipped his forces are against the Fremen. Their home of Giddy Prime has a black sun and thus they aren't used to this one and have to wear clunky helmets and visors that worsen their visibility. This is why they do the friendly fire and also don't catch the soldiers sneaking up on them. Barely escaping with his life, we see how Raban will do anything to flee death while the Fremen will happily give up theirs in the service of their leader. It shows that the Harkonnen will ultimately lose because they run when faced with a fair fight and this is why they resort to tactics like artillery strikes and bombing. Cutting across to the Emperor, Erlan and Helm Maheim, they're clearly scared of Muad'Dib's ascension. But the plan is to let the war continue and then the Emperor is going to come in and seem like a peacekeeper. However, both Erlan and Helen see the signs that it's clearly Paul and Erlan proves herself as the Benny's most valuable student. Thus, they realise they have to adapt and change plans and then discuss how the prospect and fade. Ow! Now that takes us to Giddy Prime where we meet Austin Butler's fade. Unlike the book where he had long ringlets of curly red hair, they've kept him bald in line with the rest of the Harkonnens. According to IMDb Trivia, both Bill Skarsgård and Barry Keoghan were considered for the role, with the former of course having a familial relationship with the Baron. That didn't stop Butler though, when he underwent vocal training to sound more in line with Stellan. Gaining 25 pounds of muscle for the movie, he apparently researched Gary Oldman and Heath Ledger when preparing for the role. He stated in an interview, I've always been inspired by Gary Oldman and many of his roles, Leon, The Professional, or True Romance, or The Fifth Element, and you know, we've talked about Heath Ledger a lot, the sense of play that he had, and like I say, it's not the specific things, but it's more general inspiration. Describing him as a cross between a snake and Mick Jagger, the former was actually attached to play Fade in the Jodorowsky version that went under development in the 70s. Weirdly, Leah Sidhu's great uncle Mikkel was attached to that as well, which was confirmed by the documentary on the movie. This never materialised, with it then being Sting who played him in the David Lynch version. Sting was actually asked to cameo for this movie, and though he turned it down, he still attended the premiere. Yeah, Fade is far more psychotic than that one, with its section basically being pulled from chapter 35. That takes place on Fade's birthday, which the Baron has declared a holiday. Now we see the planet mainly through the eyes of Margot and Count Fenring. Now we know that the latter was going to be a character in the movie with Tim Blake Nelson playing him. However, his entire role was cut along with Stephen McKinley Henderson's. The latter filmed a few scenes as Hauer, but he too ended up on the cutting room floor. Now in the book, Howard was taken prisoner by the Harkonnens due to them losing Peter de Vries. He'd been their loyal mentor in the past, but with him getting gas, the Baron didn't have one. Thus how it was brought in, and he was employed as the Baron's right hand. They kept control of him by secretly giving him a poison, and then giving him the antidote laced within his food. Thus if he escaped or betrayed them, he'd die, which was a wicked plan from the Baron. He ended up trying to dismantle the house from within, and I'm guessing we would have seen it happening in these scenes. Now as for the Count Margot, the book has them arriving in chapter 35 with them secretly being on a mission. They witness the walls being painted and the banners everywhere, however, this glamour isn't shared in every aspect of the city. They notice rubbish and brown walls reflected in dark puddles, showing the murky side of the city hidden away. One passage that's always stuck with me says, In the Baron's blue wall keep there was fearful perfection, but the Count and his lady saw the price being paid. 
Guards everywhere with weapons and that special sheen that told the train I they were in regular use. There were checkpoints for routine passage from area to area even within the keep. The servants revealed their military training in the way they walked, in the set of their shoulders, in the way their eyes watched and watched and watched. Now this entire chapter is basically about the Count scaring the Baron and he hints that the Emperor may charge him with treason. He also brings up how he hasn't approved his heir yet and they're there to see if he's up to the task. And that takes us into the gladiator battle but here we get the build up to it. Painted black and brought blades, we can see these are black and white too. This pulls from the book where we learn more of Howard and Fade working together. They decide not to drug the slave so that the slave master will be blamed. They also change the blades about as normally a white blade would have poison on it. The bobs themselves that the weird hammerhead figures use, they're too covered in a poison as well. Instead, they want to make it so the match seems more thrilling, as using drugged fighters makes the crowd just get bored. However, a keyword has been implanted into the soldier that will make him collapse upon hearing the word scum. The Atreides fighter actually gets the upper hand in the book and he grabs the white blade believing that it's poisoned. Fade uses the black one instead and it paralysed him though he managed to fight back. I'll talk about that more in just a bit but Denny added in these three cannibalistic women to make the scene even creepier. He's watching him test the sharpness of his blade by killing his servant, it, it's pretty messed up. He also puts it against his mouth to see if it will cut his tongue and works out that it needs to be sharper there. Now, whenever we go into sunlight on the planet, we see the infrared style which was shot using specialised cameras. Cinematographer Greg Frazier wanted the people feel like it was a monochrome and binary system where every single decision was simply black and white. It's life or death and no colours allowed to rise or be seen, leading to a distinct looking world that's impossible to forget. Even the fireworks which would normally spray colour, they're completely stripped down to just being black and white. At the hour 12ish mark we see the black sun and then the Baron coming out onto the balcony. I love how he's in colour under the shade and then as he passes into the sun's light it then turns white. This is done beautifully with the Benny Gesserit and we see their cloaks turn from black to white under the harsh light. Watching the arena just open up, it's breathtaking and it's here that we see the gladiators come forth. The final one is named Lieutenant Lanville who's a character that appeared briefly in the first film. Kinda wish they'd given more focus to him so it hit home a bit harder but either way I, I think it works really well. Fade ends up saying, which is also something that he says to Paul right at the end. It shows how psychotic he is and how his response is always going to be the same. There's also that level of respect there because Fade views combat and bettering someone is an honour. This is why he removes his shield and doesn't run and hide when he realises he's not drugged. In the book he shares that respect too because the fighter says, One day, one of us will get you. Fade knows he shouldn't be able to do that because he's poisoned and he thinks the Atreides may be more than men. You can catch the Atreides mark on his forearm as well during the battle with it being something you can spot around the hour 17 mark. It's also there when he tries to, to stab him uh, and yeah it clearly shows that he's been marked as one of their people. In the book the crowd then chanted for Fade to cut off his head but he gets a proper burial as a sign of respect. Now it's also at this point where Margo says Plants within plants. This is something Jessica said during chapter 25 with her wondering if she's part of a bigger scheme that they're just not aware of. Now it's after this that the Fenring started to put their plan in place and they communicated through their own humming tongue that sounds a bit like buzzing. Mmm, sounds a bit like this in the book. If you listen to audio book, it's talking like this. I'm not I'm being serious. The Count gives his wife permission to go secure his bloodline and it allows her to go get Fade's blade. Not like that. You see, they're on a mission for the Bene Gesserit which is sort of brought over here even if the character's missing. It's so seductive, looking like an aftershave advert and we see his Fade seduced by her. They also do the Gomjabar test just like the first film but here it seems like Fade might actually enjoy it. It's described as creating unimaginable pain but if that's what you're into then you're gonna love sticking your hand in her box, eh? Fade also says he dreamed about Margot the previous night and it could show that he has prescience as well. In the book the way things were meant to happen is that Jessica would have a daughter and then this child would marry Fade. Those two would then come together to finally secure the Harkonnen and the Atreides bloodline and this would lead into the Kwisatz Haderach. Through this child the Benny would have control and they'd finally have one of their own on the throne. This would mean that they were finally in charge but Jessica's plans that they changed it all up. Anyway I'm leaving Geely Prime now. I'll see you later. Now back with Margot and Benny and the Jets we get some extra little details. 
This includes Fade killing his mother, which again shows how the Harkonnen don't really value women. Margot is still giving the Benny a daughter though, possibly in the hopes they could try the Kwisatz program from another side. Now this child grew up to be Marie Fenring, who was trained as an assassin in Paul of Dune. Fade of course never had a relationship with his daughter, but even if he'd stuck around, I doubt he would have cared. I think it was smart to have the Baron and Jessica never interact, though originally they had a scene in the first film. That was the one from the book in which she wakes up bound after the attack on Arakeen. The Baron offers her to Peter, but also says he can choose to be the Duke instead. He chooses that because he seeks power, even though he, he's a bit obsessed with Jessica. Men are what mattered to the Baron though, and we see him anointing Fade as the governor. Butler actually improvised the kiss here, and I love that cheeky little look that he gives to the camera. Now from here we then head back to Arrakis and see the return of Gurney Halleck. Playing his ballast set this is a big part of the character with there originally being a scene involving it in the first film. However this was cut but here it returns in all of its glory. Based off of Zitha this is seen as an evolution of the instrument with it also containing 9 strings. Ballasets are a big part of the book with Gurney playing his and singing to a dying soldier during chapter 28. When Paul reached the sea edge he also saw Jamis had one during chapter 34. The book said it reminded him of Gurney and he scanned the future of the timelines in which the pair were reunited. There were actually some where he killed Halleck and this was down to him believing that Jessica was the traitor. They skipped over this in the movies but there were several characters that suspected it was her as they thought UA had conditioning that wouldn't allow him to betray his masters. Lado even went along with this in the book and it added some tragedy as he was called to Jessica in his final few days with her. Now chapter 42, that ends with Paul spotting some ornithopters from smugglers scanning the desert and in 43 we see things from Gurney's side. That's very much how the scene opens with us seeing the smugglers through the binoculars first. 43 then opens by describing the spice factory that the smugglers are at. Gurney skims the area with binoculars for a spice signal and then waves the ornithopters to go over and look at it. This scene is basically them going to that area with Gurney strumming away on his ballast set about how much he hates the desert. The music he plays here is reminiscent of the MS-DOS game, except there it was much faster. Full of piss, my hand is caked in sand. Chapter 28 explains what happened when Journey joined the smugglers. Though he could have fled the planet, he chose to stay behind and get revenge. Though a fallen attack would have been pointless, he realises that there's other ways to do it. Disrupting the spice harvesting will greatly affect the Harkonnens and this will probably have Raban getting smashed like the like button. Halleck is desperate to get revenge on him due to what he did to his family and also for the scar he gave him on his face. Halleck was a prisoner in the slave pits of Gidi Prime where he was then rescued by Leto. Anyway, chapter 43 is where the ambush happens and we see the majority of it through Gurney's eyes. He sees they have rockets which fears him and he also notices a crouched figure who stays still amongst the sands. He clearly says they have advanced training from that stance and it's at this point that it's revealed to be Paul. In the frenzy, Gurney even thought for a second it might be Leto and it shows how the son's becoming the father. I love the way this scene plays out with them using mines and just raining down chaos before they then attack. Paul says... I recognize your footsteps, old man. Calling back to these lines from the first film. I can tell it was you by your footsteps, Gurney Halleck. I recognize your footsteps, old man. Gurney also calls him young pup, and the pair hug it out before Gurney explains what happened after Arakeen. Now at this point, the pair have a conversation, and Paul says he could lead to the death of billions if he gains power. The fear within him is clearly becoming stronger and this is touched upon during chapter 43. Paul sees that most of the timelines with Gurney have favourable outcomes but with that victory also comes a loss in himself. Paul explains that he's allowed people to think he's dead for his own protection which Gurney's annoyed at because he would have came looking for him. The book has Gurney saying, I thought I had nothing left but revenge, however seeing Paul makes him realise that there's more. Now, he's been on the planet as long as Paul has but his eyes on blue. This is because the smugglers are able to get food from off-world that isn't laced with spice. He sees Paul as being touched with a spice brush and also wrestles with the fact that a lot of his friends have died at the hands of Muad'Dib. There are legends of him taking the skin of a Harkonnen to make a drum kit and both he and his men have feared him for years. In the book anyway, I know it's I know it's months in the movie before you, you better not be coming in. Now, this also allows for the reunion of the No Country for Old Men cast as we see Brolin and Bottom actually on screen together. 
they kind of didn't really interact in that movie. They had they had their little scenes, but they didn't really speak. Um, other than that phone call. And if you want to check out our breakdown of that movie, it, it's going to be linked at the end. So go watch it. Here yeah, they kind of have a bit of back and forth banter, or as the book says, the pair have instant respect. Paul's told Stelgar several stories about him, and he appreciates Stelgar for going and protecting Paul. And with Gurney also comes the fact that Paul has access to atomics. The atomic convention was first mentioned during chapter 6, with it being a big no-no in the universe. Obviously, during the 60s when the book was released, there was a lot of fear over the use of atomic weapons. Hiroshima hadn't happened too long before, and thus Herbert was playing off a lot of fears at the time. Though Paul ends up using them at the end, chapter 47 reveals that he's used them on mountains instead of people, so it didn't really defy the convention, technically. However, if you read Doom Messiah, then you'll know this opens the door for a new call to Stoneburner, which has dire consequences. At 1 hour 42, Paul has a vision of one causing harm to Chani, and though this doesn't happen, it hints to the destruction that they can bring. Revealing the location of it, we can also see the Atreides Hawk on the vault door. Only accessible through Paul's DNA, we see an expansive stockpile stretching as far as the scanners can see. Also wonder if Paul putting his fingers into the holes was a visual reference to the box and how he put his hand into that. Both were necessary steps for him, with him having to reach in in order to gain the next level of power. And from here, we then cut to Irland, narrating what it's like living in the south. We get a good look at the letters on her diary here, with it being written in desperate alphabet. This is based on the Latin alphabet, with it being used by the royals and elite. Now from here, we see the process of getting the water of life, with a sandworm being drowned. We see firsthand that the worms can't survive in water, and I felt, I felt, felt a bit sad for the little guy. Now this in itself, though, spells doom for the future of Arrakis, as it shows what will happen when they terraform the planet. All of the worms will become extinct, and though they'll have a paradise, they'll still kill off the species. The Fremen seemingly want this to happen, but as we get into the book sequels, there's definitely some regret there. However, Stelgar still has this dream, and in chapter 34, he talks about how they'll trap the dunes beneath the grass. Stilgar says that no man shall want for water, and because of all the lakes and ponds, they'll be able to dip their hand where they please and drink whenever they want. Having a vision of an explosion in the desert, this can be taken as either foreshadowing of the nukes or the destruction of Sietch Tabur. I can see that as being the case, as Chani represents the tribes and the scenes are shot in the same way as the vision. At this point, Sietch Tabur is destroyed by the Harkonnens, with them using good old fashioned artillery. The Baron talks about how genius this is, with it being a section that pulls directly from the book. It says, The Baron could feel the distant chomping, a drumbeat carried to him through the ship's metal. Brump. Brump, then brump, brump. Who would think of reviving artillery in this day of shields? The thought was a chuckle in his mind. Now people had become so reliant on shields that they often didn't even consider just hitting something with explosives. Atomics had also been outlawed as well, so most people, it just didn't cross their minds. You really see the power hierarchy here as well, with Fade literally getting Robanticus's feet. Going to the CH, we see a boy covered in blood walking through the area, potentially playing off the death that would be brought forth by Paul's ascension. The War Council is then called, and the leaders must gather with Paul finally being forced to go south. Only leaders are allowed to speak, and still God's willing to sacrifice himself so Paul can take his position. It shows how he's become a fundamentalist, and also the dangers that come with this. I feel like Stelgar's a comment on this in general, as initially we don't take him seriously. We see him as being, you know, a bit of a jokey guy, but even in the end, he helps usher in annihilation. Outside, we then see as Paul touches the ground, echoing the shot from the first film in which he touched the waters of Caladan. This is him saying farewell once more, and finally deciding to go south. Chani says he will never lose her as long as he stays who he is, and this in the end is why she ends up leaving. She realises he's lost his way, and isn't the man that she fell in love with. She shackles and cord, and I think she represents the converted. Whereas once she saw Paul as an outsider, here she clearly dies supporting his message. They also kill the messenger birds, which were used as communication between the Fremen. Chapter 44 explained that Paul made his command post in the caves, filled with birds, as it allowed him a way to quickly communicate with others. Heading south, Paul steers away from Chani, symbolically showing how he's going away from her and the Fremen. Drinking the water of life, he follows a woman from behind, who is later revealed to be Alia. Chapter 41 explains how Fremen and Baby are left to cry when they're young, and this gets them used to the idea that they can't waste water. I do kind of wish we got more of Alia in the movie, as the chapter really outlines just how creepy she is. It says that she says things no other two-year-old would understand, and that she's only pretending to be a little girl. 
Aaliyah even explains what it's like going through the water of life with a book saying, One day I woke up, Aaliyah said. It was like waking from sleep except that I could not remember going to sleep. I was in a warm, dark place, and I was frightened. Listening to the half-lisping voice of her daughter, Jessica remembered that day in the big cabin. When I was frightened, Aaliyah said, I tried to escape, but there was no escape. Then I saw a spark, but it wasn't exactly like seeing it. The spark was just there with me and I felt the spark's emotions, soothing me, comforting me, telling me that way that everything would be alright. That was my mother. Loved seeing Anya Taylor-Joy pop up in the movie, and if Variety hadn't spoiled it three weeks prior, it would have been a great surprise. They even spoiled the spoiler man. I'll never forget. Now, chapter 45 had the aftermath of Paul drinking the water of life with him being in a coma for three weeks. Typically, these rituals were only done by women because they're the ones who were then selected to become the Bene Gesserit. Paul is going to be the first man to live through it, and this also unlocks things that weren't given to the women. That is, the history of men in his bloodline, but along with it, he also gets the women. This is how he's able to see Aaliyah, as she's connected through his mother. We get some shots of elderly women from before, with this being a scene that pulls directly from the book. In the source material, because he's out for so long, Jessica suspects he's been poisoned, and that there's a traitor living among them. Some Fremen even believe he's in a trance, and channeling his thoughts for their final battle. However, Jessica knows it's not that, and this is why she then sends for Chani. Chani explains how she wakes him up, and basically they put more water to his lips, which he automatically converts because he's had the water for so long. Jessica takes some before he's woken up and puts it to her lips to convert it for Paul, but he wakes up as she's doing it. It's here that she realizes that he's taken the water of life, and from this point, Paul isn't the same. This is seen in his costume as well, with it taking on a black hood that's very similar to the Grim Reaper. Here he's awoken by Chani using her tears, showing how much that idea of losing him means to her. Jessica could have done this herself, but she's forced Chani with the voice so the prophecy can come true. He gives a look to Jessica the chose, he knows exactly what she's doing, and he's well aware he needs to manipulate the people. Chapter 45 is when he becomes a quiz at Tadarak, and Paul from this point isn't the same man. This is seen in the score itself, which now takes on Harkonnen notes instead of being the bagpipes from the first film. We see Paul doing creepy Doctor Strange stuff and talking about timelines and also confronting Jessica about their lineage. Here he's embracing the darker side to his genetics, which is why he becomes such a ruthless ruler. Discovering he's actually the Baron's grandson now has allowed him to tap into something he's never had before. Cutting to Paul arriving at the temple, we begin what's one of my favourite scenes in the movie. The scene in itself is almost shot like it's black and white early on, which may have been done stylistically to align itself with Gidi Prime. Pacing slowly, this plays off the figures who are often present within Paul's visions. Before it was his mother walking away leading to the death of billions, which he's done by spreading his name. Now though, Paul is walking towards us and he's bringing that death with him. His holy war will change the face of Arrakis, which is exemplified in the next moment. Approaching the Fremen, we see them moving out the way for him and get a bird's eye shot of him walking through the crowd. Now this is symbolic on a number of levels because this resembles grains of sand. Arrakis is of course made up of it and it's something that the planet's completely covered in. However, Paul wants to change the landscape and usher in a paradise. Now, I'm not going to get into major spoilers for Jew Messiah, but there is a passage that's always stood out to me. A certain character we follow says they long for the desert, and though things haven't changed in the paradise Paul envisions, they are starting to alter. Paul moving through this crowd like it's a grain of sand is too symbolic of how he's going to change the Fremen. He will alter not only Arrakis, but also them too, which this shot of him walking against them sums up perfectly for me. So we not only have Paul walking through through without being stopped, but we also have the three key things he's going to change. The worm is behind him, the sand is being shifted, and the Fremen themselves are being moved out of the way. Now, this is steeped in lots of religious imagery, with it being reminiscent of Jesus' arrival on Palm Sunday. Though everyone is ready to go to war for Paul, Chani sees the battle as being something that will lead to more deaths. Chani is the dissenting voice in the crowd, but she's ushered to leave, which is when she has an outburst about how the prophecy is there to enslave them. That first movie had the opening narration with her wondering who the next oppressors would be, and unfortunately, it seems like that's still the case. At this point she's grabbed by Gurney but she tells him it's none of his business. 
He says the Harkonnens gave him his scar, and we see how quickly her descent is shut down. Now, this also highlights what's really going on here and the charlatans that exist in the room. Gurney is there like one of the Fremen, even though he doesn't believe in the prophecy. He's someone who wants to get Paul to use it to his advantage, though, so that he can use the Fremen as a way to get revenge. If Chani brings this to their attention, that's going to potentially stop that and means that the Atreides can't get their revenge. So she wants to stop this train before it starts, but unfortunately, the ride's already left the station. Now, in the book, uh, that prophecy is something that I think people may think is true, and it definitely can be argued. The way the movie takes things, though, I think is that it's fake, and that Paul's using his abilities to make sure it comes true. The prescience and the ability to see the future, that's all true, but he's weaponizing it and leading things to the outcome that works out best for him. He's well aware that going south will lead to billions of deaths, but it's also the only path that's going to keep him alive. It'll also keep his family and friends alive, too which is something that we see with how he tackles Stelgar. He should really be in an impossible situation where he has to choose between defeating the Harkonnens or saving his friends. Paul completely shuts the idea down and shows straight away why he's doing things for himself. Chapter 44 is where the majority of this goes down in the book with it saying the quote, do you smash your knife before a battle? The passage then says, I say this is fact, not meaning it as a boast or challenge. There isn't a man here, Stelgar included, who could stand against me in single combat. This is still Stelgar's own admission. He knows it, so do you all. Now the book here points towards Jessica realizing that Paul's using the voice slightly, which is how he's able to manipulate them. Jessica also remarks that the scenes Stelgar and Paul cooked up worked well, with it being something I feel that the pair planned together, in the source material at least, though yeah, it, it, I think that it is genuine. In the film, he says he's now leading the way and that their mothers warned them about his coming. He explains pretty bluntly about how their ways are stupid and that you shouldn't destroy the best of you just to keep up tradition. He's also told he can't speak if he's not a leader, but he completely breaks this rule too. It symbolically shows that he's tearing down the ways of the Fremen, and in doing this, replacing it with himself. Personally, I believe he saw Chani's death, and also knew that this was one of the only ways that he could save the woman he loved. This is why, in the end, he subtly hints to her about what's going on with Erlan, which is something that stands out more on a second watch. Now, this obviously doesn't go down too well, but Paul commands the crowd and instantly shuts them down. Picking up on someone's past, he lists off things he shouldn't know, and this makes the fighter instantly bow before him. In doing this, everyone else follows suit, and it's such a powerful way to show the power of belief. Now, I take the scene in being one of two ways, with it being something you can potentially view due to his new abilities. The first is that he's either picked up on the old woman's memories from the Water of Life and is able to see into someone's genetic memory. I think the more likely one, though, is that he saw this conversation playing out millions of different ways and then use that as a guide to say the right things. Rather than being a psychic, he's seeing the outcomes that will now lead to them all bowing before him. Even picking out this specific soldier is something he may not have done in an alternate pathway and it's a moment you can see from lots of different angles. He's deliberately picking out a powerful skeptic because if he turns them then the rest will fall in line. It's what Jessica did but on a much smaller scale, however you can see from the room that it has just as much impact. Just him saying that that their mothers warned them of his coming shows he's also embracing the Jesserit's manipulation. Throughout the film, he's constantly talked about how it's been used to sway the group, but he's now happy to use it to his advantage. However, he also mentions Arrakis's prior named June. This is what completes the scene and transforms him from a man into a messiah. Telling them to fear the moment, he controls them through their inability to stand up to him, and thus he's able to seize control of them. You can completely see why Paul sways their mind, and he promises that he'll lead them into a green paradise. This is something the Fremen have wanted for so long, and they now believe it's possible. It's totally something that cult leaders and politicians use, and they weaponize promises to get people to fall in line. In this moment, we instantly understand what it's like to be part of a cult and I'm sure you yourself you know what it's like getting swept up when you're watching this scene I do I have to admit I was taken away by it and this shows the depths of Paul's manipulation we want him to win and we want him to do this even though we know it could lead to billions of deaths. The idea of revenge is too much for us now, and we're happy to go along with the prophecy. He then pulls out his father's ring, and to me, this shows what's most important to him. He's finally accepting the burden of being a duke, but also highlighting the driving force for his actions. I don't think it's any coincidence that we then cut to Gurney, who smiles like he thought Paul may have forgotten. Personally though, I think this is Danny telling us the reason why he's doing this, and that it's in fact just about revenge. He's willing to wage war, 
war because there's no other way in which he and his loved ones survive and thus that's more important to him. Now it might be something that I'm completely misrepresenting and that's another thing that I love about this scene. You can easily take it in several different ways and see what you want to see from what Paul gives us. There's still a side of us and the ones that love him who want to believe the good man's still there and this is also touched upon during chapter 45. That has Chani saying that though everyone knows him as Muad'Dib, she knows him as a different man. Whether he's lost himself though that's all up for debate and his ring then allows them to create the seal which allows him to contact the emperor. Now from here we cut to the emperor receiving it and the Benny says there's only one way for her family to survive. We get Florence Pugh killing it in that headwear with the production designers looking at the head coverings from medieval knights but also religious figures like the Virgin Mary. Watching his ship entering the atmosphere, I love how we get to see Arakeen's reflection as it pulls in. This ship is similar to what we saw in the first film with it arriving on Caladan to enlist the Atreides. From here, Paul mounts up his forces with it all going down in the final few chapters. They have the line, he who can destroy a thing has the real control of it, which pulls directly from the book. Here though, he's talking about nukes, whereas they do something different in the works. In there, he wants to put converted water of life above a spice mass, which will change it into the water of death. This will then kill all the sandworms on the planet and thus completely end spice production. Chapter 46 has Paul scanning the basin of Arakeen and looking at pop marks in the cliffs. This shows where his father's men were buried with them being tombs from the Battle of Arakeen. This chapter also describes a storm rolling in which we learn from Stelgar is a great grandmother. This is something he says in the movie with Paul foreseeing its arrival. It helps to scatter the Emperor's ship's shield as Sam moves slow enough to break it. The book has a meaning that they also can't fly thopters during it and we see the damage this causes when the worms roll in. It also states the guild won't risk going to the planet to fight due to them potentially destroying the spice. You see, they have prescience ability due to needing it to navigate but in the end this just holds them back. Because they can see the future as well, they'll always try and choose the safest route to keep themselves alive. The Fremen though, they'll happily head into battle and die, meaning that they'll always have the advantage. Chapter 46 is them breaching the shield wall and this is one of the most outstanding shots in the entire film. Also, I promise I'm not getting paid every time I hold this book up. Either way, they fly in the Atreides banner and we see a shot playing off the vision in the first film. That had Paul imagining himself in this battle, whereas here we see that it's actually Chani. The difference shows that Paul's visions aren't always consistent, however it also hints at how things have changed. Paul was the one originally willing to properly fight for honour and so on, but now he just wants to take power. At least that's how I take it anyway. It's such an incredible scene and just watching those worms come in, it's just a breathtaking way to bring to life something I'd only ever imagine in the books and we'll, we'll see it in that 80s film. Now where things differ is that in the work, the Emperor came in during chapter 47 and he completely ignored the Baron. That devastated him and it wouldn't be long until the figure was dead. The Emperor then seats himself and the Benny walks behind the throne and rests her hands on it. The Baron notices her long withered fingers and realising she's a truthsayer makes him start to panic. You see truthsayers are basically human lie detectors and it scares the Baron because he's been hiding so much. In the movie we see the Reverend Mother using battle language at 2 hours 12 minutes highlighting how she's brought in to detect his lies. It's also important to note how the light makes a cross with it of course having religious illusions. We watch Paul march along the desert in his black cloak again showing the arrival and death along with his forces. Now in the book they talk about the Fremen being fundamentalists and say the women jump on our blades to open a way for the men to attack. The Emperor then asks about the South, with the conversation being like the movie. Difference is though that the Emperor orders the Sadukar in and they bring forth Alia as a captive. The Baron is scared of her gaze and even the Benny stand back. It's through Alia that they know Paul or at least Jessica is alive and she warns them her brother's coming. As they enter the throne room, they're almost silhouettes with a book describing them as black robed figures coming in through the sands. Alia ends up killing some of the soldiers and she then marks the bodies for the water recovery team. The Baron tries to grab her but she uses the gum jabot to poison him which eventually leads to his death. Here yeah, though, Paul is the one who kills the Baron with him saying he has to die like an animal. Stabbing him in the neck, this is a reference to the gum jabot test in which those that failed got a needle in it. I love how in his final moments he's also just trying to crawl to the throne and yeah, lots of subtext in him failing to get there after being stopped by Paul. We see his body's given to the sand which is a nod by Denny to Lynch's film Blue Velvet. He wanted to pay homage to what had come before and this is a really cool little detail that connects it all together. Now in the book, at this point at chapter 47, Howard also dies. 
He was sent in as the final assassin by the Emperor, which Paul foresaw in one of his visions. Howard is given a poison needle to stab him with, but he doesn't go through with it, and he then dies succumbing to the Baron's poison. It's at this point the Emperor finally shows fear, and the last Harkonnen is then picked as the champion. Either way, we see Gurney get his revenge with Roban, specifically killing his sister Beth in the books. Paul shows how powerful he is using the voice on the Reverend Mother, and it's a reversal of her saying silence to him in the first film. Silence. Consider what you're about to do, Paul Atreides. Silence! And normally, you wouldn't be able to overpower her with a voice, but it shows the skills that Paul now has. Fade is presented as the champion, with this being known as invoking Con Lee. Paul calls Fade cousin, and this is the same thing the Baron addressed Leto as in part 1, right before the gas scene. Paul says, may thy knife chip and shatter, which is something that Jamis originally said during chapter 33. The fight scene here is echoing the end of part 1, and in many ways, it is very similar. Both end with Paul winning, but in that victory, he loses something of himself. Now, the book explained how combat without a shield had to be done differently, but that most still fight as if their opponent has one. They still got to strike the killing blow, but then slow down because they're trying to penetrate the shield. I love a part of the chapter where Paul talks about all the variables in combat and how many paths can splinter off from it. Even a cough in the crowd can change everything, and thus complete concentration is required. The book explains that Paul doesn't talk to Fade, which throws him off, and his attempts to bait him don't end up working. We also learn that like a slave, he has a special word implanted into him that will make Fade lose if Paul ever comes to it. Paul refuses to say it though, even when he's losing, which shows the honour that he carries. Fade also asks if Chani is his pet, which is a line that pulls directly from the book. It says, That woman you were talking to over there, Fade Rather said, the little one. Is she something special to you? A pet perhaps? Will she deserve my special attentions? I love how twisted it shows that Fade is, because he of course keeps three women as pets himself in the movie, so it's a bit weird. Now Paul then scanned the horizons of time and seen that at this point it was the point of no return and either way the jihad's gonna happen. If he wins it's still gonna go on and he realises if he dies they will say sacrifice his body and his spirit now leads them. He also predicts that Fade will be rewarded for killing Muad'Dib and that he'll be allowed to be the emperor if he wins. In the book Fade also has a hidden blade in his side which was brought out during the David Lynch version. Paul rolled and used this against him, whereas here he allows himself to be stabbed in order to draw Fade in. Here it's Paul with the hidden blade, which is kind of a backhanded tactic showing he's willing to fight dirty. It's an incredible battle that's really tense and such an amazing climax of the film that comes full circle from that ending fight with Jamis. Upon winning in the book, the Emperor almost strikes Paul but Erlan holds his hand back and says this is the closest thing he could have to his son. Paul says the phrase, Irulan, there's my key, as he's seen her several times in visions. Getting him to kiss the Duke's ring, it's clearly half assed showing how he's sort of begrudgingly admitting defeat. Paul then ends up proposing to her, which in the end is the ultimate turn on Chani. I know in the book, Chani played a willing part of it, but here we see how heartbroken she is. As her people head into the stars to lead the Fremen to paradise, she remains behind without her people or her man. Now the book handles things differently with it saying, Paul stared down into her eyes, remembering her suddenly as she had once stood with little Lado in her arms, their child now dead in this violence. I swear to you now, he whispered, that you'll need no title. That woman over there will be my wife and you but a concubine, but this is a political thing and we must weld peace out of this moment and list the great houses of the Landsrad. You must obey the forms, yet that princess shall have no more of me than my name. No child of mine, nor touch, nor softness of glance, nor instant of desire. So you say now, Chani said. She glanced across the room at the tall princess. Do you know so little of my son, Jessica whispered. See that princess standing there, so haughty and confident. They say she has pretensions of a literary nature. Let us hope she finds solace in such things. She'll have little else. A bitter laugh escaped Jessica and she said, you know that Virgin Mary comment before, it's because she, she's also going to end up being a virgin. <laughs> she didn't say that, but moving on. Now think on it, Chani, that princess will have the name, yet she lives less than a concubine, never to know a moment of tenderness from the man who she's bound. While we, Chani, we who carry the name concubine, history will call us wives. So that's how the book ends with it showing that though both Jessica and Chani weren't seen as wives, they'll be remembered as the ones who were. It's a powerful way to end the book and it plays off in Children of Dune where they sort of do the opposite. 
Lots of stuff there with certain characters marrying their sister, but moving on. Chani here though leaves showing how Paul has lost himself, and though he's won, it has come with a cost. The houses will not accept him, and now he must lead them to paradise. We see how the Fremen have been enslaved by another oppressor, and will head to the stars to bring forth the Jihad. Paul's saying lead them to paradise sums it up, but it's an idea that he's using it to downplay the death of billions, and the true cost of what attaining paradise will be. Chani trembles but she refuses to cry as she won't waste water on what's come to pass. It's a bittersweet way to end the movie that stuck with me a long time after watching it. Hopefully this breakdown's made you enjoy the movie even more and thank you for coming on this journey with us. I know it's been a long one, been very long for me, uh, 17,000 words it was and we didn't record the last 20 minutes of the video so we had to do it twice so please drop a like if you appreciate the work. I'm going insane and if you want to leave a comment saying Lisa and Al-Gaib, I'll know which Paul you're talking about. Shabow! Now if you want to support the channel as a member of the Spoiler Society, then please also consider clicking the join button. You get early access to videos every week. Uh, it's just 99 cents a month and it goes a massive way to helping us out here. And it means we can do overly long indulgent videos like this uh, that are a bit of sort of passion projects, but because of your guys' support, you know, it keeps us afloat and means we can keep going. If you want to get some heavy spoilers merch, you've also got our t-shirt land located just below the video. That will let you pick up all kinds of tops like our Theory Time one, House of Dragon stuff, Marvel tees, and a lot more. We drop new designs on there all the time too, so definitely keep an eye out and huge thank you if you picked one up. Now if you want something else to watch, we've got a video on screen right now where we go over everything you need to know about The Godfather. Love going through that movie as well. It's a brilliant breakdown. I, I know I wrote it, but yeah, I'm really proud of it. Um, and if you like that movie, then definitely go check it out. Without the way, huge thank you for sticking through the video. I've been your host, Paul. You've been the best, and I'll see you next time. Take care. Peace.